I was born in Sacramento, California, and I was considered Ray Charles in diapers because I had this fascination for Ray Charles's music. It would just make me be like a holy roller in a sanctified church. I just, yeah, I would freak out. I was about a year old. And I bought a lot of records for a lot of people at that early age, too, because I just had this knack for music. Well, my father was in the service, and we moved around and lived in Alaska, Fairbanks, and went to Japan, the Philippines, and stayed a lot of my life in Philadelphia, where my mother's from, and I was around a lot of good music, a lot of good music. And with that, I was invited to come to a radio station because I know a lot about jazz. And at the age of 13, I was I became, a matter of fact, a permanent member of the WRTI staff at Temple University. And I worked there for 10 years for free. And then I went to a paid job at WBGO, which is Newark Public Radio's jazz station, which is actually New York's jazz station. I was one of the most popular overnight hosts since Symphony Sid who goes back to the 40s and uh, made a great impact. Nice impression, he worked there 11 years. And then I went to produce records and different things uh, for a little spell and I got back into radio in 2000 and decided that I was gonna use my wares, my information and open up on the blues for Sirius Satellite Radio. I wanted to do jazz, but they said they needed a blues director. So I said, well, I know that music too. So. It became a very nice niche in my career. So that lasted from 2000 to 2003, as I mentioned. And now I'm producing records again. There was one time I was on the road with Sun Ra, man. It was a trip. First time I went out on the road, matter of fact. 1977, I think it was. We were going from Philadelphia to Canada. And we had a thing of vans that we got in, and they were packed with people and equipment. And Sunra had this habit of taking everything. You would have several cases of cassettes and clothes we knew he was never going to wear. So I guess my initiation into the group was that I had to keep my legs up in the air like this the whole time as I rode from Philadelphia to Canada with my knees in my chest. When I got out of the van, when we <laughs> finally got to our destination, I was like, you motherfuckers are cold. <laughs> I said, Why are you gonna bring, cause I can't take this going back. I had, oh man, it was so bad. It was so bad, really. But it was fun. I mean, the gig turned out to be one of the best gigs that I could think, you know. Sonny was wild then at that point, man. That was like the height of like the out thing. Because <laughs> later on, a few years later, you could see he would be kind of tame. And I missed the abstract and the wildness of stuff blowing up on stage. And the dancers, I mean, the colors, the, the different outfits that they would wear, man, and the vocals and all, everything it was just an experience that you had to be there to believe. I started collecting records actually when I was six years old. My first LP was Stevie Wonder's Down to Earth that was on Motown at that time. And then I started buying a lot of, you know, R&B 45s. You know, basically it was like a jazz household. But uh, we heard all kinds of music, country music, you know, like I said, blues, and you know, even gospel music, you know. So uh, I just had that wide spectrum to work with. And now with what I have now, it's a lot of jazz, a lot of blues, reggae. I mean, basically any kind of music you can think of is in this library, some kind of way, world music, da 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 da. So I enjoy collecting music 
because it's important for my work research-wise. I produce programs, so it helps me to be able to really open up instead of just saying, if you do reggae, this is Bob Marley. You know, I mean, there's so many people before and after Bob that have made, you know, contributions. Just for an example, great artists, but, you know, again, not focusing in on what we call the hit or popular artists per se, but giving everyone their rightful due. So my work is research, but it's also, again, like I said, keeping legacies alive and letting, allowing people to hear music. People want to hear music. Basically, my library is the history of a particular music style. So if it's R&B, I go all the way back to the very beginning for, to jump blues and then to the doo-wop era and move into the 60s soul movement and into the 70s funk, 60s and 70s funk. Uh, I don't really deal with disco because that's more of a popular type thing. I have about a understand. couple thousand LPs and probably the same a couple thousand CDs as well. Bill Cosby. Hmm. Well, he used to be a listener to my show at BGO because I played the right shit. Uh, he's a very avid jazz fan and he loved what I did. He used to always call me all the time to talk. And then one day he says, I need you to come to the studio. Can you bring me this particular record? And I brought it to him. And uh, I told him, I'm not I'm tired. I'll probably be wasted. He says, well, I need you here tomorrow morning. I'm like, okay, I'll be here. I'll be there. So I went and took the recording, and that started a four-year run from the first season of The Cosby Show, working directly under him. He hired me to work with him, and Bill would hum a song, and I would tell him the name of it, and it was like, damn, you're great. You know, he couldn't remember the name, and I'm one, two, three, 